All right. A little mundane. Let's do some mundane. All right. I just want to talk about first, though. I know it wasn't part of the reading, but the introduction, the opening. Oh, it's really short. It's just like one page and there's a couple paragraphs. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really, really good. Did you read it? No. What are you going to show me up here? What's the deal? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, like, I'm going to show you up totally. I have the real book, and it's this thick. I was thinking about getting it after reading it because I really enjoyed him so much. There's some really good essays in here, so. It's a little difficult to read when it's this thick. Yeah, it looks a little Forget thick. It. This translation is different than the one read, by the way. I think it's, at some point, it, it exceeds this one, the one, one in the PDF. This, this one's better. better. Some good differences. Good yeah, thing. I think so. Which one's better, the PDF or the book? Okay. This one. Ah, uh, the book. Oh, okay. Uh, I was going to pick it up anyway. I don't know, I really enjoyed Montaigne. You never would have guessed that he was born in the 1500s or 1533 or whenever. Yeah. It feels like he was born, like, you know, just a little while ago. Yeah. He's, he's really modern. Hmm. Which, I don't know, says a lot about him. <laughs> he is, he's really, I don't know. He really wrote straight from the heart, I guess. The only way to feel that modern and still be from 1500 is to write straight from what you see and feel. Yeah. There's no other way to do it. The book of the world, as Schopenhauer said, yeah. <laughs> the book of the world. Um, you know, uh, hmm. word essay was made by him, right? I know, I checked that out. It was one, one of the notes there. He's, he's the origin of the word essay. I looked, it on Wiki I looked it up on Wikipedia because I was going, really, that's the start of essays. And it's, yeah, it's yeah. widely regarded as the predecessor to the modern essay, right? Mm. And then they, they gave examples from, like, other kinds of forms that looked like essay. And then Japan had the, like, Zuishi or something, like, like an essay kind of form of station to go and write the pillow book. And But apparently Montaigne is the beginning of essays. And, wow, he really played fast and loose with the essays. <laughs> like, I'm just going to write about whatever. Actually, it's really good if you read the to the reader thing, the opening here, the essays in one name. Oh. He says, he says uh, so reader, I myself am the substance of my book. And there is no reason why you should wa waste your leisure on so frivolous and unrewarding a subject. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I like that. Actually, on, the, on this book, that's what they put right here. <laughs> in big text on the back, yeah. I was looking at it, I was like, cool, you, he is the subject of the book, and apparently, according to Wikipedia anyway, that, that, that actually, he was, he was a little bit criticized for that, as being egoistic, right, having a book about himself, but uh, he didn't have to worry about that. He went down in history. Um, I just like that, that he is the subject of his book. Um, I guess that kind of means that it's basically his judgment and reasoning, right? He's the true yeah. uh, enlightened man here. He's using his own judgment and, and seeing things as they are. Um, I, don't, I really liked what he said too in the beginning. He was in, in, in this to the reader. He said um, he is, he's writing. Why did he write this book? Right. Mm. I have intended it solely for the pleasure of my relatives and friends, so that when they have lost me, which they soon must, they may recover some features of my character and disposition, and thus keep the memory of they have of me more completely and vividly alive. Mm. A great beginning. Because yeah, he really. It's like he's alive. Mm. He really pops through these essays, right? This is his immortality. Definitely because he's such an interesting writer, too. I mean, like, yeah. he, he didn't write dry at all. Yeah, he was willing to write about a few things that surprised me. <laughs> yes. The weird conversations that were going on in the 1500s. Um, I'm kind of curious. We had five essays, but how do you want to do this? Do you just want to talk about your favorite essay? Ooh, uh, I have a, I have a little something to say about most of them. Um, which oh, so should we start? I'll, if we're gonna start, let's start right the first one though. Then be called happy until after his death. I want to talk about one, maybe the most or the imagination one. But I want to start with uh, let's start with no man should be called happy until after his death. Okay. All right. I don't know. I first when I first read this essay, I you know of course he back to the old Greek 
uh, expression, you shouldn't call anybody happy until after you died, which, right, that's the famous story of Solon, right, that he repeats in the beginning. I, I really, I really like this essay, and I'm kind of, I like the idea that no man should be called happy until after his death. I don't want the first time I read it, I don't think I understood it as Montaigne understood it. Um, because, or maybe I did, but he also understood it in, in, in that way in another way, because, all right, he's like, okay, how you face death is something you can't fake. All right, so I mean, when you die, right, it, it comes out what, what kind of man you are, right? That's why, you know, we need to see your dying moment, the last act of your play, to see, you know, really what kind of person you were. <sighs> um... So basically, I mean, he's he was taking this more along the lines of, can you meet death with calm? And that was basically his his deal here, right? I, yeah. It wasn't like, you know, right before you died, did you go go out and get a line of hookers and and some cocaine? It wasn't that. It was like, did you meet death with kind of calmness of and stillness of heart and and nobility? the moment of death. Um, so, here's my question. Um, what about the movie Rashomon? So, it's, maybe it's not such a great example, but here, here's a story of a guy who did die, uh, and he's still lying. He's lying to protect his reputation, I guess. I mean, he, he's dead. I mean, and now he's a ghost, so I guess he's kind of still alive. But, I, I, I mean, like... I'm sure this guy, even as he was dying, he would have been obsessed with his reputation tried to, and tried to protect it by lying, <laughs> even as he was facing death. So what 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 happens when we take into account the Rasho and taking Rasho Mon here this kind of thing like the the lying dying? Yeah, I mean, I mean, wow, well, I don't know. I, I I get what he's saying here, but I, I want to make a better point about this in a different essay. Uh, up to another essay, but. For example, Zizek, he always brings this up in a lecture, the people they call their families and the 9-11 flights and they say, I love you, before they, they're dying. And like, well, but maybe they didn't really actually love their families. They're just calling to make a good end, right? They're kind of lying right at the end, right? Does that somehow make up for a life of cowardice and evil, that they did one last seemingly good-looking act at the end? I don't know, it doesn't in my book, and I don't know, for some reason I just can't also see that a life of, uh, of generosity and truth can be spoiled entirely by a completely cowardly end. Yeah, uh, I mean, this must be, uh, this is why I had to reread it, because these, these are my thoughts, and then I was like, oh wait, he's just thinking like a stoic. I mean, he's saying something like, if you're able to face death with nobility, there's something unfakeably great about your character. And that's it. Uh, if you're able to do it, there, the, you have accomplished something that most men couldn't. Even if you were a bad guy. Yeah. I I kind of get that. And I, I, I see what he's on about a little bit. Right? I mean... I think just instinctively, this is how we feel. For mm -hmm. example, Boba Fett kind of met with the uh, wow, the, Boba Fett, the biggest <laughs> death ever, right? He really went out pretty crappy. He was hit on accident, and he 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 fell into the pit of Sarlacc. Wow, what a crappy way to go for the world's best bounty hunter! It kind of tarnishes him a little bit. I'm just talking about the moment of death, how he how he went out, right? A little bit distinct from this essay, but just that moment mm. kind of makes him look like a fool. 
right? And then mm-hmm. that kind of tarnishes his entire reputation up until that point for me. And in the same way, you're going to sound crazy, um, Yagami Laito in Death uh. Note, he really didn't face death well. Even though he had spent his entire time killing people, he mm. really faced the death poorly. And it really made it made it look like he was really kind of a, a weakling all the way through, right? Just that end moment, that last moment where he loses the game, right? And he's crying and, and, and bargaining and, and scheming and he just can't accept it. And I guess maybe that's when you're supposed to see the real Yagami Light, right? That, that he was a scheming, scheming conniver, that he was really weak and scared and... It really did kind of mm, it tarnished <laughs> the rest of his life or his previous mm. life up until that moment. It really did. I mean, just instinctively, I felt it. The Joker and the Dark Knight said something similar. I remember when Joker was in the prison? Uh, they caught him in the prison, and then Batman left, right? And um, he met that he that other officer came in, and he said, "Yeah, how many friends? How many of your friends have I killed?" Um, and he's, he's like, no, you're not going to get me to beat you up. He's like, yeah. Um, he's like, five. He's like, oh, five? He's like, well, I know. I remember each one of them. I remember which one of them begged for their lives and which one went out bravely. Maybe I knew them more. Maybe I knew them better than even you did. Mm. Uh, so even the Joker kind of thinks this way, that like in the last moment when he was killing them, if they went out bravely, that they were really brave soldiers and brave police officers and the ones that screamed and pleaded for the death. He, he kind of knew that they were actually just really just cowards. Um, so the Joker kind of believes this too in the Dark Knight. This is not exactly uh, uh, an, an out of the mainstream viewpoint, mm. right? At this last moment. No, and he's going to. Oh. I was going to say, what like, if I save a little bit? Oh, what's that? What if I could save him? What do you? What would you think about this miniature defense? Well, before you uh, give the miniature like, defense, I just mm. want to link it up to one last thing, mm. and then you can give your defense. But he's going to say later in an essay, um, is it on the power of the... I forget which one. Um, I, I think I know what you think. I think it's probably think on the uncertainty of our judgment. On the uncertainty of our judgment, and he's going to say, yeah, I think everything you do yeah. speaks to your character. Okay. Mm. These two ideas are linked together. Mm. Um, and this is what he's going on here. Now, I just want to say yes and no. <laughs> but please give uh, me your defense. So maybe maybe is the point here that if I was going to defend him on this point, say like, no, no, Montaigne, like people lie when they die. Um, it happens all the time. Like, maybe like the guy in Rashomon or whatever, uh, because they want to, you know, protect their reputation. Is the problem then just we just don't have enough information? That the Dying Act still speaks volumes about their true character. It's just that we as bystanders simply don't have enough information to judge what the Dying Act means even though it does have intense meaning? That was exactly my theory. That uh-huh. I was going to bring this up later on the one the one that said in the sermon to make like like when he said that your, your, every one of your actions betrays something about your character. Hmm. Yes. Yes, it does. But you don't know what. Yeah. You don't know what. For example, not being... He brings up chess in a very bizarre way here, but not being good at chess does not necessarily mean you're bad at strate- strategy. Hmm. It could mean that you're an arrogant person or a lazy person, right? Um, it could have a thousand different meanings. So, sure, sure, Montaigne... All of these actions speak towards some kind of character, but it's. I just want to say it's. It's really, really difficult to know what these actions speak about. Mm. I mean, they, each one of them could have a thousand different interpretations. So, mm. in the same way, a cowardly death could mean a thousand different things, right? Yeah. You have to know this person inside and out before you can make that judgment. That that was what was really speaking toward his character, right? mm. that he just didn't freak out then or something, or that he was lying at the end, or you know, 
I mean, he was just an, such an incredibly vain guy. He's like, well, at the end, I have to show off the world. Right? Mm. It's just, it, it just made of vanity. And that, that could be it, too. Well, that, that doesn't sound like the world's greatest man to me. Mm. But, yeah, what, what does it say? We don't know. <sighs> Good question. I think that, that's why he kind of went weird by focused so much on a calm mind. Because that is really something you can't fake. That's just something you are or not when you die. But uh, I kind of want to keep the more interesting point, which is the one we're talking about. <laughs> uh, whether or not like you're some kind of stoic. Okay, yes, you're a stoic. Uh, but I don't know. Also, maybe it depends... I suppose, yeah. It could mean any different things. It really could. You really have to know the person. I was thinking, like, like if you had the ability to do something, but you chose not to. Like, I don't know, one time we were at, at work, we had, like, some of the other people at work were discussing, like, well, if the world was ending tomorrow, what would you do? Or what would happen? And, like, they were th- saying, like, crazy things. Like, you know, I'd go out and sleep with, like, a million girls, or I'd be doing drugs all night and stuff. I don't know why. It just occurred to me at that moment, like, in a really perverse way... This is what I said. I said I would go home and live my life exactly as I had been living it up until that moment. In a really, I said, I don't know, and they're like, why? And I said, wouldn't it be like the most perverse but interesting justification of your entire life? Like your life was just so beautiful that you could, you just wanted to live it the way it was one more day, right? I mean, hmm, I, I don't know. It, it seems like in that case. I, I it could just be my character. Maybe I'm just too cowardly to go out and kill and rape and do drugs. But yeah, cowardly. Uh huh. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I suppose it could be something about my character. Me, like I really, really want to, but like here I'm, I'm talking a big talk about going home and like eating pizza, you know, like I do, like at every other in like an average day. But oh well, this is that uh, you'd have that pizza. Though. Yeah, well, that pizza would be freaking awesome. <laughs> I would have like three or four pizzas actually. Well, I'm living on the edge now. The world's oh, wow, you're talking about living dangerously. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> World ending. Three more pizzas. <laughs> Interesting. That's one of the first things that that uh, the guy in Groundhog Day does. Great. <laughs> Uh, I mean, also, like, I suppose, being the philosophy club, we can also, we cannot not mention the death of Socrates no. and what Nietzsche took out of Socrates' dying words also was was some of these lines, too, and they revealed something about Socrates that, you know, life, Nietzsche took it to mean, like, life was a disease, thank you for the cure. It's another yeah. famous example. He also said that he committed suicide, too. That he willingly yeah. walked into the poison, right? <laughs> Which would be another big part of his choice to die. Right? He's like, oh, this is a crappy world, and I'm out of here, man. It was a disease, and I'm cured. I, I suppose when you choose to commit suicide, and then you say, this was a terrible world, and now I'm cured of it. Hmm. Does sound like you don't like life. <laughs> <laughs> Might be grasping at straw a little bit there. Doesn't sound good. All right, that's all I got in for. That's all I, I guess the one last thing I want to say about this is that, um, I don't know, if I just want to be argumentative here, I'm kind of a little anti-Schopenhauer, I just say that uh, what what is to say that you are the same man you were when you were 20 that you were in your 50? Hmm. I mean, you change a lot in your life. I mean, you can see how much you change by the way you look at movies. When you rewatch a movie, you see different things. When you write... When you look back at your writing, you're like, oh my god, I wrote that? Yeah. That's me? Right? I mean, you can really see how dramatic you change in just a couple of years. Think of like 20 or 30 years. I mean, what, what is to say you are even the same person? Hmm. I mean, he's under the idea that your character is consistent, kind of like Schopenhauer would say. But if I was going to be argumentative, I'd say, well, he's not the same guy. Wow. Uh, I suppose you could spell it a story, though. He could have been a brave guy who deteriorated. Mm. I mean, if you're going to take it into like a lifelong narrative, you'd have to do something like this, wouldn't you? Like, he was a noble guy, but he became a wimp. Something like this. Okay. I suppose, yeah. I mean, up until that moment, though, he was noble, at least for the first 20 years or so. 
Yeah. But, like, at some point, like, he cracked or something. Right. So, but did his death, his cowardly death, portray that he was never noble? Maybe, I don't know, you'd have to keep, you'd have to keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, it'd have to show that he wasn't able to bear the burden that life had put on him all those years, and he faced up to it for as long as he could, and then he snapped. Uh, something like this. But he was able yeah. to bear it for a while. Yeah, yeah. But not for the whole time. Again, yeah, you have to get in such a minute detail. Like, I, if you went back, you're like, and it took it his dying moment, and it's like, yeah, when you were six, that was such a long man. When you, <laughs> six, you said, I wouldn't be scared of, like, the Grim Reaper. It was a lie when you were six. So, yeah, I suppose. If you're taking it that far, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I was just kind of thinking a lot today about movies and how much people change. Just because even when I was rewatching Back to the Future, I just saw so many different things this time when I watched it than I did other mm. times. Or when I rewatched The Fly, you know, we, we watched The Fly when we were very young. Mm. And rewatching it now and seeing how incredibly brutal and violent and, and disgusting that film is. I you mean, mean Pinocchio or The Fly? The Fly. Okay. But both Pinocchio too. Pinocchio too, but The Fly mostly. I was, like, it's interesting that I guess when we were kids, it didn't affect us because we just didn't have the same experience of the world that we had. So we just took different things out of the fly, right? Mm -hmm. And now that I see more about what's going on in the fly, I'm like, wow, oh, my God. This is this is an incredibly brutal film. So it's just interesting. that, I, But I didn't see that the first time yeah. I watched the fly at all. It didn't even enter into my head. Like, wow, it's the guy turning to fly. Scary man. Oh, boom, his head shot off. Oh. So you, you were confused, Matthew? Yeah, basically. I was a little bit... Um, yeah, well, you know, I really want to do one day. I want to talk about... I have to get a nice theory about this, but I just one of my theories is that, you know, just like Freud said, that we're all, we all have a little bit of psychological illness. I think everyone is a little bit autistic. And the, <laughs> the internet is... Filled with half autistic people. Hey, Giordano. Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> this is so funny. I was I've been having computer trouble trying to get in here, and then when I finally figured out what I was doing wrong, it started to log in, and the camera was lighting up, and I was like, "Oh no, I gotta put on clothes." <laughs> 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 Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> That's a good idea for female viewer. Yeah, cheesecake for the female <laughs> viewers or beefcake for the female viewers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right. I'm bringing in that, that female demographic. <laughs> <sighs> but you so know what? Where, where are you guys? Oh, we were just discussing the first essay only. Uh, no man be called happy until after death. After his death, in the last oh. moments of a man's life. Basically, yeah, we, we kind of talked that. I think we're just about to move to the second one, which is yeah. the imagination one, which is I, I was hoping you'd be present for the imagination one. Oh, boy. Because you're like, you are all about the imagination, man. Imagination. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. That that other one, uh, what did you decide? Can you, can you can you give me like a summation about the uh, about death? and? I thought, what, oh, did, what was he saying? What was he saying? I thought he was saying that... Uh, Something like God. I read it this morning. I should, it's, and I was thinking I should take notes. What, what did you guys come up with? Did you? Did you? Um, we had to kind of hash out what he could mean by the, your death. It reveals something about your character. I mean, cause uh -huh. if you read it, if you read it the wrong way, it seems like it. It seems like it's wrong. If you read it the wrong way, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I was. I was trying to talk about it with a friend of mine on Facebook, and he was talking about this kid, this Canadian actor from mm -hmm. Billy, who just yes. overdosed. Ah. Yeah, he, he tweeted about the uh, shark tornado. <laughs> I that. what his last two his last two tweets were about a well, shark tornado. You know, it was a heroin overdose, so that that yeah, explains well. that. <laughs> <laughs> At least he was feeling good, and I'm not trying to make fun of uh, you know somebody who obviously had you know. Uh, a really good time going on in his life, or, or a really bad time, but it does make you wonder, like, what does what does his his life ending that way? How are we going to judge, like, 
his entire life. Maybe that's what I was thinking when I read the article. Mm. Like, will your entire life be judged by the way you die, or your entire life cannot be judged until it's over? Mm, I, don't, I don't know. Mm. It's like I, I, I was listening. I was listening to. I heard Dustin briefly when I was trying to get on say something about the nine nine eleven people, but I lost it. Like I lost my connection with you guys at that point, and I was uh -huh. wondering what you were trying to say. Like we think these guys are heroes, or these guys were must have been really loving people or something because. because well, those... I guess if I was just going to recap quickly, I was I was just going over. First, I went over examples of people that I thought their ending of their life tainted the way that we see them. So I wonder, first of oh. all, I want to say, like, Montaigne did have a point. Like, sometimes, no, and I brought up a really crazy example, Boba Fett. Okay, so the world's greatest, <laughs> bon world's greatest bounty hunter was accidentally hit off the side of a ship and fell into the Sarlacc pit. Okay, wow. Yeah. But the crappiest way to die ever, and now he looks like a bit of an idiot. Right, okay. but he was really cool before that, wasn't he? Yeah, and I, tell had, his, I had his action figure. I had his action figure <laughs> <laughs> and then he fell off a boat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> best bounty hunter. Um, it's just kind of examples like that where it uh, does feel like sometimes the last moments taint. I mean, it just it automatically you just feel it right away. But I was also trying yeah. to get of how the last part of your life could also be a lie, right? For example, we were talking about the 9-11 people. For, for example, like Zizek, the philosopher, always brings up this example that you can just imagine a man that cheated on his wife and had a terrible family life his entire life, and then he was on that plane, and he knows that he's going to die, so he calls home and says, I love you, baby. Ooh. And he hangs up. Okay, well, did he really love her? I guess the real answer is no, but he was just kind of trying to make a good ending of it. Um, yeah. Does that forgive his life of, of you know cheating and lying? I don't think so. It seemed like he was lying at the end. It didn't reveal anything true about him. In fact, it just made him lie more. Um, Ouch. Yeah. yeah, stuff like that. Or, or for example, the, the, of someone that did good deeds all their entire life, and they met with a cowardly end. I mean, does that nullify all the good they've done in their life because they mm. met death like a coward? Mm. I, I kind of I wonder about that a little bit. Yeah. And then I, I kind of finally said, like, also, I just want to think about wh what is to say that you are the same man that you are when you are 20, that you are when you are 50. I mean, you can see how much you changed in just a couple of years. I mean, obviously you write a lot on your webpage, right? Just look, of course you obviously must do this. When you look back at your old writings, you're like, is that me? Yeah. I wrote these things, right? In just a short time, you can already see how much you've changed as a person. Yeah. And you're like, well, so when you're 50 and you're this new man, does that nullify the man you were when you were 20? Or vice versa? Mm. Nullify. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well. So, I, I tried to defend Montine a little yeah, bit. Try to save I, it here. I tried to save it just a little by saying, like, look, we'd have to, like, first of all, the problem probably it must be that the problem is we don't know enough about these individual people's life lives. Mm. So if we knew more about the guy who was cheating on his wife, we could look at his last act in its true meaning which was, it was an act of desperation by a man who was vain, right? It would spell out a lot about his life if we knew all the, the details, right? Like he's mm -hmm. on the plane and he's one last vain act. That really says a lot about his character. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, the problem is we, we just don't have enough information yeah. about a lot of people's <laughs> lives And that, that, vain, that vain act is to salvage his reputation before yes. he incinerates. Yes. Okay. So I guess uh, our conclusion was that He's right, but it, to judge a person's last act, you have to know so much more about their life to do it, right? You have to know almost everything about them to be able to accurately judge what that last act meant. And we're, this is going to come up in a later essay about on the uncertainty of judgment. An essay I really like, actually, but this yeah. is the same idea comes up, that, like, everything you do betrays your character, right? He talks about this, like, when you play chess... You know, it betrays a little bit of your character, or whatever you do, the way you stand, the way you drink, the way you oh, eat. Oh wow, it's so true. Out, right? It's true. It's true. I remember I was playing tennis briefly when I was in college, and you learn a lot about a person when you're playing a, like an individual sport mm -hmm. like that. You know, you kind of learn like, wow, this person is sort of tricky. You know, this person is underhanded. He always does this lousy drop shot when, <laughs> you know, yeah. when he's when he's when he's when I'm backing him in a corner. 
you know, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, and they always say in Japan, too, the Chinese game Go or Ego, when you play it, they say your character comes out chess, too. It's often said that your character comes out when you play chess. Mm. The common thing is, uh, to that, I want to say yes and no. Right. What about people, okay, so like this kid, I don't know if his intention was to overdose, but the the Camus thing came up, uh, you know, about this being the only philosophical, you know, problem, and then, I don't know how, we went really far with it, we talked about uh, Romeo and Juliet, and, you know, Antony and uh, Cleopatra, and Adolf Hitler, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, like all of these, all of these people fictional or otherwise who, uh, you know, who made monumental changes uh, in society and then when they came to the end of their lives, it was by their own hand. And it kind of, I mean, like, what does that, does that, how do you feel about that? I don't know. Like, I was just thinking, like, I don't have, I, we also brought up Trayvon Martin because yes. obviously there's a lot going on in the States. What about, you know, when someone else ends another person's life? That person can't, he didn't, Trayvon didn't have the option to go calmly. Mm -hmm. I think the article said something about you needing to go, you know, sort of like facing that last moment with calm. Yeah, Montaigne was kind of a, a bit of a stoic, right? He thought okay. there was something, it spoke about your character that you were able to die with calm. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if he was able to do it and, you know, who's able to do that. But those people that I mentioned before made the choice to go. And so, uh, you know, perhaps they were, you know, calm in the moment, but mm. to make that choice, I don't know, I kind of feel like maybe this isn't the bravest way out. Although, the samurai would disagree. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, uh, yeah so... I know, I guess, like, I, I get that. Like, Freud, Freud, for example, too, he he killed himself, like, he was old and in pain, so he... Mm. he, had, he had Did he kill himself? Freud, yeah, I mean, they had, he had them, well, he was euthanized, right? He was ah, okay. physically in pain, right? Okay, from, yeah, yeah, yeah. From, I forget what he was suffering from, some disease, right? So he chose to die at a very old age, by the way. Yeah. He chose to die. Mm -hmm. um, and Hitler, right? You say Hitler chose to die, too. And what does this say about... I don't know. Like Some of these deaths, like Freud's death, I'm more willing to forgive. Yeah. I mean, come on. You know, you... Old. He lived yeah. his life. He freely chose it. He was in pain. And I'm like, okay, you, you had a great life. And yeah, go for it. Bye. All right. Yeah, get get out it's, of here. It's harder to, I guess it's, it's harder for me to justify when the age starts going lower, 20, yeah. 30. Then it stops it's looking good. like a free choice and it starts looking like a psychological illness. I don't know why that would <laughs> It starts to look like that. Illness, yeah. I called it escapism, but I, I, I did say earlier that, you know, I don't know if that, that, that actor... To having a tough time, or if he yeah. was if he was planning to have a good time and it went wrong. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a point too, you know. Like the younger you are, like that that kind of factors into how I'm going to judge you. Like Whitney Houston, I mean, like she kind of people sort mm -hmm. of gave her a hard time. Like this kid, I just read on Yahoo uh, a couple hours ago. They were talking about that kid in Canada, and they were like, "Oh, it's a tragic loss." And I'm like, tragic. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like, he was a yeah. kid on Glee. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, he, he's going to be replaced next season. Easily. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't know. I mean, it is tragic, but it is questionable also. Like, I don't know how much sympathy I have for him. Especially when you're living such a charmed existence. You know? Like, if somebody is dirt poor and they decide, fuck it, I can't... Oh, Hell with it! I can't take it anymore. You know, boom. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I kind of get that more than somebody who's getting paid millions of dollars a year mm. to sing on television every week. I don't know. Anyway, okay. Yeah, I mean, we just don't know why he died, right? I mean, was it? It was an overdose because he wanted to kill himself. Was it because he wanted to have fun? Was he yeah. troubled? I don't know enough about it. I don't know. I know, yeah, we don't know enough. It's, that's why I don't know if it was tragic. You can say fuck it on YouTube. There's, there's no sense in oh, yeah. You're right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I just realized that. Yeah, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, that was like O'Reilly, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it live, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting stuff. <laughs> so, I guess, yeah, we, that really kind of fits into our conclusion. Like, mm. 
it, your your death and your life tell a lot about you, but mm. but what that says, we don't know. Right? You have to know so much more about a person before you can tell what what what. For example, that they they suck at playing chess means, right? <laughs> and it could mean they're bad at strategy. Strategy. It also could mean that they're lazy. It also could mean that they're arrogant. It could mean a thousand different things that you suck at chess, right? I mean, it can't. It doesn't just mean one thing, and you have to examine the entire person's life to know what the act of sucking at chess would be, right? Yeah, yeah that's a, you know, this is actually, this is really a big thing, isn't it? I was just thinking about the difference in the way we have felt about people who died from cancer versus people yeah. who died from AIDS, you know, which aren't really very different, you know, disorders. Um, in the way they, you know, attack the body, but uh, just the way that they're developed is what we're basing our judgment on, right? Yeah. Mm, but, yeah, so, yeah, a person's life and then a person's death, it's like, I don't know, I don't know. Like, I remember once a really bad guy who used to be a member of our church um, died, and I just remember, I was a young teenager when he died, and I remember listening to the minister eulog eulogize, is that, what, is that how you say? Mm -hmm. Eulogize him. And his mother was sitting on the front row, obviously in tears and just, you know, crestfallen. And just, I mean, she was, she was destroyed. Uh, but the minister was not really sympathetic because this guy was sort of a thug. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just sort of doing that, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he was trying to be gentle, but without, you know, you know, without ignoring the fact that, you know, this person could have had a longer life, perhaps. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, the way he died was pretty violent. <laughs> and so we judged him. We judged him, didn't we, based on that. Like, he could have, you know, maybe, like, had some sort of turnaround, some turning, come to some turning point in his life and then become a, you know, a school teacher or, you know, something, in, you know, something, done something redemptive okay. and, then, and then die the same way. How would we have felt? Right. This is what I want to talk about in my favorite essay. Let's save this idea. I want to talk about this exact idea in my favorite essay. Uh... On on uh, uh, on what on Heraclitus and um, Democritus. Democritus, right? Course, this is my favorite essay, and this is the exact thing I want to talk about. Save this idea for that. Okay. I, I don't want to go because I want to link a couple of these essays together. Mm -hmm. I want to link them together, and this is what these two are ones I already wanted to link together. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I I I really think that there is, I think, like there's there's a strong impulse in our cultures to think that in moments of, of absolute terror or death or tragedy, that somehow you're piercing to the real character, whereas I guess it to be the this, this, this cynic I am, I just want to throw a couple dozens there, there and say, perhaps even at your most terrible moments, you're still lying to yourself a little bit. And that, I did, that would kind of just throw a little bit of a monkey wrench into what he's up to here. Um, mm -hmm. But, okay. Um, but I think he, I want to redeem him in my favorite essay, which is what I want to talk about your example. So let's move on to, to the imagination one first, and then then I want to talk about my favorite one. I don't know. Who, who, I, I, my favorite one was definitely on Democritus and Heraclitus, but I don't know. Let's do the imagination one, which is a very good essay, too. Who doesn't like an essay about... <laughs> yeah, that's what this essay turned out to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Like, uh, you'll see it. I, I was trying to contact you guys while I was trying to get in here, and I, I made a comment. But anyway, yeah, this 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 was really funny, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> if, if I'm thinking about the word, I didn't get to I didn't get to the Heraclitus Democritus article, but I did get through a few of them. I think this is the one that I I was laughing out loud at some of the, <laughs> at some of the things that he said. <laughs> in terms of our, in terms of our personal power, yeah. <laughs> personal like powers, it. yeah. I, I just didn't know it was cool to write about penises in the fifteen hundred, but apparently it was cool. <laughs> all talking about our members, <laughs> and he's quite cynical. He's kind of funny, like when he talks yeah. about like the guy that that wants to see who's sick and he wants to see someone healthy. He's mm. like, yeah, well, when I see someone sick. I, I deteriorate at the same time he gets better. And I was like, wow, well, bam. <laughs> but it, this happens to me, too. Like, when I'm with somebody mm -hmm. sick, I feel like, 
like I, I take on there. Right. Total There's, hypochondriac, right? I do yeah. the same thing on I do the same thing on the trains here. Like I, I sometimes I try to do it discreetly, but sometimes I move away from someone if they're like coughing or sneezing on the train. Yeah. I'm I'm like, no, I no, I've gotta go or I'll take out my fan and blow really hard. <laughs> like, like, away, germs, away! <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't mm. trust it. Mm. This was this article was really wild to me. I thought, okay, why does Justin think uh, I, I I'm gonna like this article? In the beginning, in the be well, you ne you never you never said I would like. It. You just you just yeah. said it was something you, that you I know might appeal to me. In the beginning, he does. It's yeah. In the beginning, he seems to like write. He's writing in support of the imagination. He said that he was. Wow. I think we. Oh no. He he he, he lived in this horrible. Oh. Yeah. Are you there? Oh no. Okay, you froze for a second. Oh, did I? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, but now you're good. Oh now. You guys just disappeared. Oh. Can you see me? Yes. Yes. I, I... Oh, there you go again. Okay. okay. I don't know what just happened. I'm 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 doing I'm wireless, so there might be uh... some distractions. Yeah, it turned really strange. I, I just thought like, what is he trying to say? Like what like the imagination <laughs> the imagination is dangerous. It's it's it'll cre it'll 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 take you away, you know, like you It'll get out of control if you trust it too much. If you if you if you allow it too much, you know, like domain in your life. But it was really spooky, kind of like. <laughs> I mean, and he gave example after example. <laughs> <laughs> and I really wasn't sure what it what it was at the end. I don't mm. I don't know like I don't I don't know how I felt in the end. But it was mm. really funny though. Yeah. yeah. It was it was really funny. I like how he also said like you know a lot of people talk about how the you know the, the penis is out of their control so like they kind of blame it for that but he's like no actually most of it's out of control isn't it right a lot of your functions are totally out of your control your breathing your heart rate describe... yeah all of this <laughs> yeah yeah your appetite like, comes and your appetite right I thought that was a real interesting section because he said. Uh, <laughs> he kind of took it to like he like pretended he was like a lawyer because Montaigne was actually trained in the law, so he made this fake mock okay. court case against the penis, right? <laughs> and then uh, he actually in the end he, he he not only accused our body parts, but he, he in the end I love the end where he he accused the the will itself of not go doing what we wanted to the very will that's persecuting the penis for not following it, mm. right? Which was uh, he said you know sometimes even our very will doesn't. Do what we wanted to. Like we think we, we think we shouldn't be desiring that piece of chocolate, but we really, really, really do desire it. Um, mm. I love his final defense against the very will that's persecuting the penis. That was excellent. Yeah, I thought this was great. And then this last thing uh, about like, uh, how can you believe anything? You know, whether it be right for a, a philosopher to write history, right? Well, it's kind of interesting. I don't know why. It's all of a sudden, he came out of there, right, out of the blue. In this kind of courtroom thing, he's like, you know, even if you witnessed something and there were other w witnesses right there, you still wouldn't prosecute. You could still couldn't prosecute somebody, but people yeah, are daring yeah. to write history about a thousand years ago. Right? Um, how yeah. could you do that? I was like, oh, it's interesting. Right? Mm, interesting. Hmm. Uh, I'd like to, uh, I mean, he started with... He started with two things with it that were that imagination plays such a huge part in, though. He, he started with empathy, mm -hmm. and you need an imagination to be empathetic, um, which is what he's talking about with the sickness, uh, mm -hmm. registering if people who are sick. And then he, he talked about sex, and imagination plays such a huge role in sex, um, not not only in the normal sex act, but also when he talked like his constant talk about like impotence and impotence and stuff like this, right? Yeah, was like, like even like Freud, Freud almost said right? exactly this. I was gonna I was gonna say I want to suggest this is like a proto 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 Freud. Yeah, this he, line he right was, here. Yeah, he's kind of trying to like to to these this guy, his friend of his, who he gave that weird medallion to or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's like he tried to work through his mental issues so that he wouldn't be impotent with the woman. Right. Because like, he was gonna get cursed or whatever. Did you see what uh, he said when he brings it? What brings it on? It was just, this is almost directly right. This mishap is only to be feared in an enterprise where the mind is immoderately torn between desire and respect. 
Mm -hmm. that's, that's just the essay we read about Freud, right? I mean, that, <laughs> that your liking for a woman and your lust for them get mixed up, right? And then when you, when you can only respect a woman, you can't see her in a debased kind of sexual way. You mm -hmm. begin to be impotent. This is almost exactly Freud's idea. Yes. I was impressed. And uh, that's an excellent line about the woman going to bed with a man ought to lay her modest, modesty aside with her skirt and put it on again with her petticoat. That's <laughs> yes. like that's a line that should go on forever. I know that was a line. wonderful line. <laughs> please, 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 everybody, let's do that. <laughs> I'm having a weird thing happen over listening. Oh no! But you guys keep going in and out. Oh no! Oh no! Can you hear us now? I yeah, I can hear you, and then you'll disappear, and then you'll come back. So I'm just trying to. All right. I'm afraid uh, to log off and come back in. It... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you might not be able to get back. Should we? Uh, anyone have anything else to say about the imagination? So, let me ask: Was mm. he saying that you have no control over your imagination and? what it does for you is sort of, sort you of, know, sort of hap, hap, happen, like, uh, sort of, it can be manipulated while it's, it can be manipulated because that is sort of like this psychological manipulation that you really don't have any control over. Uh, but you can you can you can impress it because he said something about like it makes sense that if you were like looking at horns or something like this a dream that you were growing growing horns yeah um so maybe you can impress things on your imagination but ultimately it's out of control and so you shouldn't mm. you can't depend on it mm. can I just say what I thought the point of the essay was, and then I want to hear what you think last. And then I just want—I think the point of the essay in general was that you're not as in control mm -hmm. of your life as you think. Um, yeah. But in general, I think, yeah, if he was claiming you're out of, totally out of control of your imagination, that must be wrong. Yeah. You know, I think he's just no. trying to say like you know, it runs away with you sometimes, and it happens like a lot, right? I mean, you find yourself daydreaming about stuff you shouldn't be daydreaming about, and like all of a sudden, like I don't know, you're you're. He's erect when you're looking at a beautiful girl, and it, it shouldn't be, right? Like, all this, like, it just ran away into this, like, like <clears throat> you are periodically out of control, and you're kind of scrambling for control. Like, I, I'm, I'm assuming the, the, the best thing to do would be to try to align all this stuff, right? To try to make it one. But, like, you find yourself in many situations where what you should be doing and what you are doing are diverging. And you got to kind of scramble to get it back together again. In that way, don't you think he's adding like a different level of sophistication to Stoicism? Because he is a Stoic. You can feel it in the way he's talking. Mm -hmm. But the Stoics would say, but you, you can't control the outside world, but you can control you. He's actually kind of saying, well, sometimes you kind of get out of control too, right? Isn't that like a, a little added level of sophistication on top mm -hmm. of the Stoics? A little bit of psychology is slipping in here, right, for the first time? Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I, th I think yeah, he's trying. He's trying to do this. Yeah, I don't know. I guess yeah. I uh, I think I'm in control, don't I? I think I'm in control, even though I know that there are things that are out of my control. But as much of my life as I can, I try to control it, including my imagination. Mm. Especially my imagination because I'm an artist and I thought about artists, like people who, impressionists, for example. Mm. Um, it, it's really left up, up to the observer to derive a meaning. Mm. And hopefully to be moved by that. I don't know, like, Maybe this guy is he is he is he like is this a, a determined? He was a stoic. He said that about himself. Um, I don't know. If, I haven't read an essay where he says I'm a stoic. But because I get a lot of really emotion. I get a lot of emotion from this article, and I get that he feels like I don't know passionately that you know things are out of your control. But 
but not not completely. Right. Because he said he did say that like he was a person of imagination. He yeah, said yeah. that, right? Yep. Yes. Yes. But then he made that strange. I'm trying to remember what he said without looking at it, but I should just look at it. He said, "Uh, where is it? I, I don't. I, I don't feel like looking for it." Um, he said something about I don't resist it, but I try to avoid it. Yeah. Mm. Or some. I'm. I'm not really sure what that meant. It sounds like the same thing. Mm. Like I. I don't resist it, but I try to avoid, avoid it. Is it, that right? right. Yeah, that's what, what he said, yes. What does that mean? I think he means, like, for example, he doesn't put himself in situations where, or he tries to avoid situations where he he's now well aware his imagination is going to get the better of him. Okay. Like, so he avoids sick people like, uh -huh. in, order, in order not to feel sick. For example, a teenage boy wouldn't be watching late night movies yeah. if he wanted to avoid <laughs> getting excited. Yeah. <laughs> but when he's there, he's going to get excited, right? He knows yeah. So you just not watch the late night movies, perhaps? Or something like that thing? <laughs> but he did, okay, so then he started talking about the bodily functions and how they're out of our control. But then he made that really funny point about your blasts. And how, <laughs> so like, <laughs> I thought that was, that was super great. <laughs> It was like there was a there was a guy who thought he could control his blast <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe he farted himself to death or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought, okay, so I, I you're kind of losing me here, uh, but, <laughs> but it was funny, and I I don't know. It's like and that was so that was in his mind. He thought he could. He could control. I don't know. It was that. It was really confusing. That was when I started to get lost. I was laughing out loud, but I was also I was also getting lost. And I thought I'm not sure where where he's going in the end. But I think I took from it that mm, I'm not in con control, but I can I can definitely make huge impressions on it or small impressions on it. Mm hmm. <sighs> yeah. I I mean I think he he might if he was. A little bit. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I haven't read enough. I mean, you could you can work on these things, right? You can you can try and get your rein yourself in uh, eventually, right? I mean, as long as you you get to know, like, oh, whenever I see a sick person, I I start feeling sick. So maybe I can work on that either by not seeing sick people or you know telling myself this is all just a you know this is all just a mental trickery and I shouldn't be doing this, etc. Mm -hmm. etc. Et right? I mean. But more, yeah, I think the you're right. The the, the general in his essay is um, things are a little bit out of control, right? And yeah. <laughs> you gotta you gotta be aware of that. Basically, was his end here? Yeah, I, I think he's just trying to kind of like say like, yeah, maybe you're not quite as in control as you think. And it, that's gonna be kind of a theme. I think that's a theme actually in these essays. Yeah. At least the ones we chose. I don't know about yeah. your random happenstance, but that's certainly gonna run into the next one. The uncertainty of our judgment. Yeah. It's okay, certain. let's let's go to that one then. All right. I mean, uh, like, this is really interesting because all it is is a bunch of examples about um, mil mil military victories or defeats. And he's saying, yeah. well, if he'd have done that, it would have been a defeat. But if he'd have done that and he would have won, then they would have considered that was a brilliant victory. So, um, like, he gives constantly both examples back and forth about, well, you could do this, and you know, if you're defeated by ch one chance, they'll say you're a great loser. But if you win, they'll say you're a great victor later. Um, yeah, he's kind of. I, I guess the real point of this one is that, um, wow, you, you can't be certain of your judgment because chance plays an, a huge role in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And that um, when you make a judgment, that's not the end all and be all. What's going to happen? You make the judgment about whether the military fords the river or not. And then Chance plays, makes a call, and then you come out looking like a, a winner or the world's, the history's worst loser ever, right? Mm. But uh, your, your judgment is not going to be entirely decided just by your act. It's going to be luck is going to play its hand. It's going to roll the dice in there. And so your judgment isn't as certain a thing as you think, right? You can't just simply win military va battles <laughs> simply by your judgment, right? Yeah. Somebody's, yeah. God's going to roll the dice, and it's going to come up heads, or, you know, it's going to come up, you know, whatever number it comes up, and you know, you're going to have to deal with that. And just because you did something doesn't mean that's why you lost. It could, 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that's why you lost. Mm. I mean, so there's a large element of chance. The, the, the world is really kind of out of control a little bit, right? Yeah, definitely. You know, well, I think this is what he's trying to say here. About it. That's, that's, the, that's the great part about it. I'm think, yeah, the, I mean, that sort of out of control element. If everything was in, if everything was like predictable and controllable, I guess life would be really boring. Mm-hmm. It would be really boring, but uh, yeah, like the Japanese, they took a chance, right, when they attacked uh, Pearl Harbor. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, they took a big chance. I don't know if they, if they can be called like poor strategists. I don't know if they knew, you know. Now just, it looks like poor strategy. Now well, it, be, but why, yeah, because, because they lost. The United States, because they lost. Okay. Yeah. But it yeah, like I mean, at strategy. the time. They could have won, actually, if they hadn't screwed up at, like, the Battle of Truck and stuff. Maybe I mean, it could, it could have been, like, a knockout death blow. I mean, if the if the aircraft carriers had been there, mm. we, we would have been, like, toast if the Enterprise hadn't left port and stuff. Well, I mean, they could have death. They would never have gotten to the mainland, but they didn't want to go to the mainland. Yeah. They, they, all they wanted was to get us out of the Pacific. Yeah. Right? Right. It was, like, keep out of the Pacific for as long as they possibly could keep us out. They wanted us out of the Pacific. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder we, how long American people would have supported a war after Germany fell. Oh. I don't know. We were pretty isolationist. We had to be dragged kicking and screaming into in Germany. Yeah. Right. I mean, after the, after the fall of Germany, and then we're now we're at, let's imagine the, the Battle of Truck didn't happen, and uh, we lost our aircraft carriers. I don't know. Were the American people willing to put up with like another five years? I don't know. Or even like if they would just said no, forget Pearl Harbor. We're just going to keep on doing crazy stuff in the Pacific. I don't know. I, I you know, looking back, of course, now we can look back and say this. But you know, if, if the Japanese had just been, you know, what, let's just go declare war on Russia, um, mm-hmm. and help the Germans invade Russia, and United States, bye bye. Don't fine. Don't sell us. You know, but the Americans were actually attacking them in in China. We were actually engaged in military operations against the Japanese, the Tamil Tigers and these people. Were, we, we, before Pearl Harbor, we were engaged with the Japanese, right, in many oh. different ways. Um, okay. But, you know, if the Japanese said, oh, forget it, we're not, you know, we're going to do it. Um, wow, I think it would have been a hard sell to get the Americans to go fly way out to the Pacific, where they, they could have yeah. cared less. And, oh, fine, take it, whatever, I don't care. Right? They, yeah. At that point, they were like, screw it, probably. And we were such a pacifist, isolationist nation. I think that, you know, if the Japanese had said, screw you, America, we're just going to go over here now. I believe oh. at the time, Hawaii wasn't even a state. Yeah. I mean, a lot not, of people didn't even know. I think I think Hawaii was like 1948, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah, I mean, so that was post a pre-statehood for Hawaii. Mm. It was a territory, wasn't it, at the time? Probably. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I really think that the Japanese. I mean, if I were to redo it, knowing what everything we know now, I'd just say forget Pearl Harbor. It didn't pay off for them in any way, attacking Pearl Harbor. It only cried. And I guess, you know, if I were Germany or Italy, I would have, uh, I would have stick to invading the England, right? I mean, mm. then, then the war would have been totally different, right? If, if Germany had just invaded England, and instead of bombing London, he had actually attacked the Royal Air Force. Wow, I mean, there would, they, they had a good chance of wiping... UK off the face of the map. Um, yeah, so maybe Hitler made a, ro- a lot of mistakes, but now they look like you know huge military blunders because you know he rolled the dice, right? And he took some really right. big chances, and they came out great too. So he looks like a genius in some respects, and an idiot in others, right? Why did he sit yeah. there in Stalingrad? Right? <laughs> um, what a fool! But then again, the Blitzkrieg, what, what genius, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's not to say it's totally out of your power either. I mean, obviously, you know. I don't think for a second the Japanese ever thought that we're going to take us out, right? I mean, yeah. they couldn't possibly have thought they were going to take us out. They, they would, it was beyond their means to take us out. All mm. they wanted to do was push us out of the Pacific. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, I, mean, I think, yeah, I mean, definitely it can't be everything. This, yeah. I mean, you could say it, this is a very well-put-together plan, but it, ants destroyed it. I mean, yeah. I mean, if they decided to attack us with lollipops... I mean, that wouldn't have worked, right? You know what I mean? Like, at least if they planned it out, right, we could have said, well, at least it was well planned out, but, you know, there was a storm that night, and it it screwed them over. Yeah. So I guess the point of this essay has got to be, 
that judgment isn't the end all and be all of what's going to happen in the world. Your judgment, chance is going to play a big yeah. role. That sounds stoic. Mm. All right, I like that. I think that's about that's what I got on this essay. I, got I just want to say one, one last thing on page one twenty five when he just says it is dangerous to attack an it is dangerous to attack a man who we have deprived of every uh, means of escape by fighting for necessity is a violent schoolmistress. Mm. I just want to say, like, um, wow. in the same way, I think it's dangerous, for example, to attack people that feel like they have no way out. For example, the Columbine killers. Um, they felt like they had no way to escape from their situation. So they, they went up guns a blazing, right? Um, they, had, they had nowhere else to defend, right? Their back was to the river, right? Um, so they felt like they couldn't escape. And in the same way, when the Japan, a lot of Japanese people commit suicide, I think that they feel like they have no way out, and they just yeah, they do the, the one act on themselves. Or a, even in a strange way, I, I don't want to associate otaku with killers, but otaku in Japan are definitely on the sub substrata society, and they, they are basically under a siege by the Japanese media. And, and even although Japan is basically an otaku nation, they're under yeah. they're otaku are under siege by the mainstream population all the time. That's so and, weird. And I don't think it's to their benefit to constantly be pushing them further and further back to the river. Right? Um, when you push people, the, the underclass, to a certain point, right, something dangerous is going to happen. Right. So, I don't know. I, I just don't appreciate the way that the, the, the mainstream media in Japan abuses people that are very weak. Mm. Uh, people in weak social positions, and I think that's also a very dangerous thing to do, just like he says here. Like it, in, in a strange way, that's why maybe I feel like Akihabara is a safe, is, it will last for a long time, because these people don't have anywhere else to go, right? Okay, Akihabara is their place to feel accepted, and there's nowhere else for them. Well, no. there's here in Nakano, actually. This well, Nakano, is, yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, this is a major otaku center. <laughs> well, not major, but it's 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 a pretty big, big attraction. Yeah. At, uh, Nakano Broadway. But it just seems like sometimes that, I don't know. I don't appreciate. It. I didn't know that that was happening here. Honestly, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know. I didn't know that was happening. I don't have television, and I don't speak Japanese like you guys, so. Of course, I miss a lot of the mainstream stuff. But. Whenever otakus are on mainstream TV, it's a laugh mm -hmm. riot, and they're laughing at them. They're not laughing with oh, them. Yeah, they're they're, yeah. they're made out to be lecherous, disgusting, uh, child men that should be eliminated. Yeah, basically. Oh. Um, yeah, there is. I don't. I rarely. Sometimes NHK will do a nice, real doc, you know, documentary about something going on in the otaku world, but yeah. I'd say for the most part. They're under siege, and you know they're used as comedy, right? And they take the worst examples of all of them, and they mm. put them on screen and say, "What a bunch of infantile losers!" Ha 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 ha! Wow. Right? And this is just this is just the the way the media works. Now, this is just this is just the, the cracks within Japan. But mm. I'd say the mainstream media, which I hate in Japan, um, they get their yucks by perpetrating stereotypes about people they hate. And one of the people they hate are otaku. Yes. And they're going to get their yucks, and they're never going to they're never going to do their job and break stereotypes. Mm. Um, no, no. They they're quite or, content with um with with perpetuating stereotypes of otaku. Also, yeah. If you want to see a wonderful, it's in cinema too. Watch. Uh, there's a movie called No One. Was it No One Will Protect Me? Dare mo mamote kurenai. It yeah. won even won an award in Canada because I don't think they understood the film. Uh, but this <laughs> film, this film is, yeah, this film is basically just a, a, an all-out attack on otaku, wow. right? How, aren't these people terrible? They are so terrible. These otaku. Look what they do. What do they uh, do? I thought they just read <laughs> magazines and played video games. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that's the ludicrous thing. But in this movie, like, this guy decides to make them out to be criminal masterminds that abduct young girls. And they're like, oh. they're fighting the police force, and I was like, oh my god. And he also turns into like a zombie force. That, a like, zombie otaku like, force that shows up on the like a, Outside of this house, and they're all like, they have their digital cameras, and they're all taking pictures like zombies. <laughs> and this film won an award, mind you. Wow. Uh, 
Um, and this is the guy that made the um, Odoro Daisosen series, yeah. right? The most one of the most successful film series in Japan. Mm. Yeah. He hates. Like he despises these guys. He despises otaku. He despises what they stand for. He despises technology, um, and more than willing to use stereotypes to attack them. Wow. Okay. So there yeah. you go. Uh, but then again, within Japan, there are forces fighting this. So I'm just saying, yeah. mainstream Japanese media, mainstream Japanese mm. media, is not an ally of otaku by any means. Now we can also debate whether that's actually good or bad. Whether otaku should be subculture or not, um, that's a different discussion. But they definitely do this. All right, that's all I have to say about this chapter. Mm, okay. Can we get uh, to my favorite? Dem Democritus and Heraclitus? Yes, your favorite one. Okay. I love how these essays are very, very tangentially related to their topics, right? They just like <laughs> the topic is here, but like he's coming at it like from out here and he just touches on it and then like zooms yeah. off. This, this is, is the, the most hilarious example. example of it because the, the words Democritus and Heraclitus come up once and the rest <laughs> is like you're like I, I read this the first time I was like, What? I thought we were gonna talk about Heraclitus. I love that guy. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that, for at least for a long time. And it's like, why does he write this essay? Like, it's the weirdest of all of them. I was like, um, but I ended up loving it the most. I thought this had the most really interesting parts to it, um, especially the beginning, right? Mm. When he's like, um, yeah, man, this is how you write an essay. It's like, you know, when you write an <laughs> essay, you, you just talk about things that you can talk about, and... You know, you don't. You never will touch all the subjects you can possibly. When you write an essay about something, you never extinguish the subject. There's always going to be something else you can say. Um, you can only add your own opinion when it's a, when it's a popular subject. You have to add your own flavor to it. Um, now, this is really an important thing. I think that when he when he says like, look, when you write about something, you will never have the final word on that subject, um, no matter what you do, right? And this is something you really have to accept, right? Um, you'll never have the final word on anything. So I guess that the word should be beware perfectionists. I mean, mm. people that are perfectionists want to have the grasp the entire thing and say the final word on a subject. But mm. I think real seekers of truth have to be brave enough to say, I will never have the final word on any subject. And part of the reason will be exactly why he said in the uncertainty of our judgment, because history too will change the way each of these things are viewed, right? And you too will change. So you're going to have to come into every subject you write about knowing that you will only be mm. a part of the discussion. And you can only be a part of the discussion, but that's okay. That's how truth works, right? Mm. You catch a part of the truth and you move on and you see it again from a different angle. Like this is the way Nietzsche works too, is that he never tried to, to capture the entire truth of anything. That's just not possible. And, and this is... This is going to sound really Hegelian, I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is just not how truth works, that you have mm. to capture a bit of it and you're going to change and move later on. You just can never, ever have the final say on anything because you'll die one day and, and mm. history will change and they'll look on uh, the era a different way than they looked on it now. And they'll, they'll see it as an era of corruption or, or brilliance, right? Who knows, right? It's always going to be changing. So mm. as a seeker of truth, this is something that you just have to realize that you can't have the final word, and that's what I liked about the beginning. Here. I was like, "Wow, yes, so true." This is this mm. is probably why he was able to write this book. He, he wasn't trying to capture the whole truth, but it didn't matter. His book lasted five hundred years, mm. five hundred years, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to bother to capture the whole truth, but yeah. I'll capture part of the truth, and then we can continue the dialogue and the discussion." And that's how truth works. Um, so he really he got it. He got it. This is how truth works, and. <laughs> Like, uh, it, this is going to sound weird from a philosophy club because a lot of the philosophers come in there saying, this is the truth and all of the truth. But we can appreciate that too because then we can say, well, this is another perspective on the truth. Right? This is something interesting in this system of his. He, he knew it right from the outset, just like Nietzsche. You're going you're gonna to catch glimmers of it, like parts of it. And you, you can always come back to a subject. You can always do that. I, I love this beginning. Even though it's, you're like, what? What are you talking about? I know. But this is not about Democritus or Heraclitus at all. Um, so, and then he goes on to his every action reveals us mm. little thing, right? Uh, the same mind of Caesar's that is apparent in ordering and direction of battle is also seen as idle and am amorous intrigues, right? Blah, blah, blah. 
okay, this is what I want to say. This links back to the first essay about like, how <laughs> death shows your character. I just want to say yes and no. We talked about this before. Because, yes, your, your every action reveals you, but you don't know what it reveals about you, right? <laughs> Unless you know an awful lot about that person, right? Mm. The way you oh, walk oh. reveals something about you, but what it reveals is, is going to be a super complex, you know, problem, right? What does it reveal about you? You don't know, and mm. you might not ever know, right? It's so, it's so difficult. Um, and then he goes on to about, like, how things in themselves are kind of have their own weights, right? But then we kind of put our own yes. we put our own judgments onto the things in the world. I felt um, Heraclitus slowly coming in. Here. Yeah, this is Heraclitus, yeah. right? This is yeah. Heraclitus, right? I was like, oh, good. Now we're getting to Heraclitus. Um, that we, we, we put our own weights in, on the world. And he has this great line, um, character drags fortune in its train and molds it to its own form. Mm. Mm. Brilliant line, right? Um, it reminds me of a kind of Solomon, too, about how, you know, the world is shaped by our emotions, and our emotions are simply judgments about the world, right? Mm -hmm. And your character is basically your judgment about the world, and how you judge and interact in the world does shape your fortune. Um, I, don't know, I, I just like this section. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then he gets into your this bizarre... Character, your character is your judgment of the world. Well, your, yeah, your emotions, your character. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then he gets into this bizarre thing about chess. It's like, yes. huh, you hate chess, don't you? Um, <laughs> uh, interesting. Mm. I mean, he says, mm. like, for rare and outstanding excellence in some trivial matter is unfitting to a man of honor. <laughs> wow, okay, so he hates chess. Um, <laughs> damn. Um, any, any particle or any occupation of a man betrays as well displays him. Um, again, yeah, same thing. It's all just, yeah, but. Yeah, but you, you don't know enough. And I guess the most important part is finally where he gets onto his topic. Yeah. Finally! <laughs> He's only got two paragraphs for that, though. Um, so is it better to to weep at the sight of the world or to laugh at it? Yeah. <laughs> and he likes <laughs> laughing at it. But yeah, you should laugh at the world because it shows contempt. It shows your contempt for the world more. <laughs> um, I like that. That's a great line. I do not think we can ever be despised as much as we deserve. Yeah. Wow. What a great line. And this <laughs> idea of like laughter is overcoming, right? You can look yeah. at the world and laugh. Um, no, I really like that. I just want to ask, this is where I want to ask my question. Um, so, would the, would the most extreme contempt for something be laughter or silence? Uh... Ah, uh, silence. I have, been, <laughs> I have been experimenting with silence. <laughs> uh, uh, I've been experimenting like, that's with silence. <laughs> 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 I've been experimenting with silence as as mm. as a display of contempt. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but now now I'm laughing at my own my own display because I saw your face post about that by the way. What did I what did I do what I say oh oh yeah 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 yes. oh god yeah what a ridiculous I, I, I because I thought how arrogant are you Tritano like <laughs> no like, I I really really you, you seem pretty hard on yourself in that post I, I yeah was, because I, I thought like how arrogant are you to yell <laughs> to <laughs> yell at adult professionals about how you feel things should happen um or should it and so then i decided okay well how about silence how about say absolutely nothing at all nothing seems to work mm. nothing seems to work but if i only had two choices to laugh <laughs> to laugh or be silent i think mm. i think i think laughter is better because that would definitely piss the other person off more <laughs> Like you're an idiot. <laughs> you're such an idiot. <laughs> like I think that would really I think that's that shows more contempt. I like Definitely. that. Like I seriously, so. like this thing that just happened in the States, I don't know if you know about this case with uh what's this guy's name? His name is like Ocha Zona or something like I don't know, he's like a football player and he was in court for something and the judge was about to like release him from court and you know, like just give him a 
a slap on the wrist or whatever the, the, the thing was. And he smacked his lawyer on the ass like he would on the football field, you know, just like, hey, we did it. <laughs> and the judge was like, how dare you? <laughs> you know, and like, he was just like, oh, I didn't mean anything by it. And she, she fined him with contempt of court. And Ooh. gave him and gave him thirty days in prison, gave him thirty days in jail for Ooh. for laughing, basically making a mockery of the court system. Mm. So yeah, I think I think laughing shows more contempt. <laughs> con, 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 contempt. Silence does nothing. Silence does nothing. Mm. I guess, I guess maybe I, I thought of, I like laughter too, but I guess laughter still means that whatever is going on means something to you. In other words, you're still engaged with it in some way, right? I, I suppose. I mean, but if if you were at silence, you're you're at indifference. You're at utter right. indifference. I mean, you've you've gone beyond contempt. I mean, you indifference. Yeah, I mean, like maybe the sounds I'm talking about is just simply not even laughing, but simply passing. Yeah, I guess passing over would be a kind of indifference when you get to that level. And I, that's what I wrote here in my notes. I was like, would that only be kind of an indifference? But um, it's interesting. That's one of the things they like to do in Japan, right? They I mean, have a word for it, suru, suru, suru. Suru, suru, um, yeah. Is when you don't like something, pass it over. Like, pass mm. it over with silence. Yeah, um, and I hate it when they do that. I hate it when you want an answer about something or you're waiting to hear from a friend and they just never respond with a text or mm. they, just, they just ignore it like it was, it was never there. Mm. I hate that. Mm. An art. Yeah. It is. It's interesting that how uh, inaction speaks very loud, loudly in Japan. Yeah. We were taught that though too, where we if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. You know, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose when it comes right down to laughter, is is an attack. But I guess in my sense too, that silence. In other words, if it was still silence and you you knew. That there was a problem, and you still made times that that would be also kind of intact. So you're still kind of engaged in both mm. ways. So I guess yeah. the greater contempt would be laughter, because it would be showing it into their face. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I have contempt for you. You are beneath <laughs> me. Um. Yeah. I guess laughter would be the the ultimate form of contempt. So I'm assuming all of us are in the laughing camp. None of us are in the weeping camp. I, I'm in the laughing camp. Me too. I, I want to say, like, I guess when it comes to when it comes to showing contempt, laughter. I guess my problem is like, was Heraclitus was he con was, did he have contempt for the world? You mean Democritus? Democritus might have. Yeah, Her Heraclitus. Uh... Did Heraclitus have contempt for the world? He had contempt for his. Is is his predecessors? Mm. That's sure. And the people that didn't follow the logos. That's yeah. sure. Yeah. Did he have contempt for the world. It, it seemed like he said, "Well, from God's eyes, the world is actually a beautiful place." Yeah. Right? He said, yeah. "What Heraclitus felt pity and compassion for this state of ours," and his expression was melancholy and full of tears. So I don't know. Did did Heraclitus really find this human state vain? I think he may have found it vain or ridiculous, but. It seems like he didn't have contempt for the world. No. Because he found it was beautiful in a certain way, right, from God's eye. At least he said so. Mm. Um, I don't think that means he has contempt for the world. I think that's just Democritus. Yeah. I think that, and it's interesting because Democritus doesn't last long because Diogenes pops up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, wait, no, Diogenes, Diogenes is here. There's somebody with contempt. Um, yeah. The first cynic, yes. Yeah, the first cynic of the first world. Cynic. Cynic. Um, who I love very much. I love Diogenes. I love him. I have a picture of him up on my wall. Um, but Heraclitus hating the world. How do you have contempt for the for the world? I mean, you can like, find the world pretty big. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah, I mean, your ego has to be pretty big to achieve. Like a global contempt. Why? 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 Like mm. there, I think the world has a lot of redeemable qualities. Mm. 
Would you say, well, how about this though? Would you say the large majority of people are kind of stupid? Yeah. yeah. Would you say that? Wow, no, there was no hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but he said, yep. Yeah, you know what? But yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not stupid. Yeah. But. I mean, like, I, even I don't think I can go so far as I hate humanity because I really have, uh, and it's kind of pathetic because I have, I, I have that kind of this hero worship for my favorite thinkers like Nietzsche and these philosophers and even Montaigne himself, so, right? Yeah. I, when I, you know, when you see beautiful architecture, for example, like some of the things in Kyoto or when I was in Florence, right, I, I was blown away by how awesome the world is. Right. Um, I just couldn't believe how awesome some of the things in Florence were, or, or, or Kyoto, right? I mean, and in that sense, I don't hate the world at all. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I just hate the majority of people that don't <laughs> follow the logos. <laughs> mm. Yeah, there are quite a few contemptible people. Uh, yeah, you. I mean, to, to hate everything and everyone, that would be, wow. I think, I think that might be a product of self-hatred. Yeah. Actually, uh, to hate so everything and you know, everyone. Um, so I, I found most people who say I hate everyone are are simply haters of themselves, right? They're the ones they 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 hate themselves because they can't fit in with anyone. Um, but okay, yeah. Uh, but I do have contempt for everyone at Costco. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and like, remember Robert Solomon said, like one of the defining he thought one of the defining characteristics of e people was um, their lack of um, what is it? He said they didn't ha feel um, remorse. Mm -hmm. So a sign of an evil person is that they don't feel remorse for their actions. But m maybe like the people at Costco, it's not that they they're doing evil, like he says, that they're doing evil and they feel no remorse. It's just they're just stupid. They don't even know what they're doing, right? I like the Socratic point at the end where he's like, they can't do good or evil because they don't know what either of them are. <laughs> like, this just sounds like something Socrates, will, like, when we read the Republic, well, I'm sure he'll say somewhere in there, but like this sounds like something Socrates would say. Like, if you don't know what either of them are, how could you even attempt to do good? How could you even attempt to do, good, do evil if you don't even know what either of them are? So you're saying it'd be right? like calling a dog evil. Yeah, exactly. It'd be like it would be in a weird way. It would be like calling a dog evil. He doesn't know what he's trying to do, but he's just like doing stuff. And, and like maybe that's what the people at Costco are to me. They're just, <laughs> like, they just—I really do. I do have contempt for them. You do have contempt yeah. for them. Yeah. <laughs> this is coming through. <laughs> <laughs> Loud and clear. I have, I have a lot of contempt. I have a lot of contempt for people on the train. Oh. A lot of contempt for people on the train. I hate those people. <laughs> I, like, like seriously, like, like, with, it's a real hate, mm. a, a, heart, a heartfelt hate mm. <laughs> that I that I pass through every day, and I I don't like that. But you know what? I don't like it about myself, and so oh. I'm always I'm always in the I'm, when I'm on the train. This is where I let out all of my aggression for what I have to deal with as a foreigner in Japan. But I do it quietly because, you know, like, what else am I going to do with it? But in mm -hmm. my mind, I'm like, you know, pulling down the window and throwing people out. <laughs> you know, like, this is all happening in my imagination, you know, like, yeah. w willingly, willingly. It's, very, it's, it's controlled, imaginative, uh, you know, I'm coming up with solutions here. But, okay, but Dustin, <laughs> Dustin, these are my, those are my solutions, like, throw them out of the window. Dustin, like, you said that you have contempt for people who don't follow the logos, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh boy! Wow, we're getting into logos here. I Not just the, okay. And, and the only thing, okay, uh, like you know, I'm 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 from the theater, mm -hmm. so like we're all about you know we're not about logos. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we're we're about emotion. We're about pathos, right? And with that gesture, <laughs> like, <laughs> we're about pathos and. Uh, uh, can I try to save the theater, though? I think yeah. the theater is... A, I mean, the good theater is about the logos of the world, right? 
about how the world really is, right? That's really good theater. Getting into what does that have to do with oh. logic, though? What does that have to do with logic? That's uh, more about, logos that's and more logic of... are, are different. Logos is not logic. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, uh, you know what? Uh, then do tell me what logos is. Oh, well, I guess for Heraclitus, it was kind of the nature of the world. Okay. I mean, it's kind of what you're doing in theater, right? You're getting in touch with how, at least even fictional characters, how, how they are, what they what they feel like, or you're portraying, That's right. you're portraying kind of how the world is in a certain way. You're giving a perspective on on the world. That's right. That's that's exactly what we're doing. And it's, even if it's, it's a mistake, putting a mirror. I forgot who yeah. said that, but it's it's mm. putting a mirror up to nature, so to speak. Mm. Right. Even if it's a perspective mistaken perspective, I still respect that more than just sitting there playing pachinko all day. Yeah. <laughs> I guess maybe what I say when I say I have I have contempt for people who don't follow logos is. I, I just I have contempt for people that have no respect for thinking thinking about life or wondering okay. at life, mm. wondering yeah. about. Let me ask you a question: Are pachinko players these people who live in the pachinko place? Are, are, is that a part of the otaku culture? No. Okay. Okay. That's a whole different thing. Those are just. But otaku yeah. culture has start slowly started to move into pachinko culture, though. It has. But those are just gamblers. Yeah. A lot of basically they're older gen they're older men who don't want to go home and they just want to zone out. They okay. just want to zone out in front of a machine. And then the worst part is that they come home and they have contempt for video game players. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. You play exactly. pachinko. Yeah. You play pachinko. It's not even a video game. It's not even half a video game. Yeah, ball bearings are falling from a hole. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And you find enjoyment in that, yeah. I mean, maybe so, there is some logos in the world there is in Newtonian physics. Other <laughs> than that, there ain't nothing there. So there's a contempt or a, a strong dislike for people who are unwilling to think. Yeah, basically that's what I okay. meant by that. I mean, yep. like, th th these textbooks all that. wonder about life. I mean, how can you go through and not... I find it, uh, maybe it's just my, maybe I'm just kind of being arrogant here, but I just, I feel so much, it feels like my life is so much more rewarding thinking about things and, and embracing the interesting things in the world than mm. just to slip by half doing things, right? You, you, I mean, I find myself doing this too, something, you watch TV and you're also half playing a video game and you're half reading a book, uh, but when you actually sit down and get in depth in something and you see it, it makes everything you do so much more enriching instead of half doing everything. I don't know, it seems like it adds a new dimension to life and then thinking mm -hmm. about life and deep connections. And I don't even want to say, I shouldn't, I shouldn't bring up hobbies like that because I think you can be a profound pachinko player. I really do. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I think you can start anywhere. You can start looking for truth anywhere. Right. Um, so I, don't, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be as is, is, is arrogant as to say pachinko is nowhere near the truth. I think, just like a, any, any conversation... Like, uh, you can start a conversation anywhere. Uh, it just can't end at the same place it started. For example, otaku, if you're an otaku and you want to meet a girl, I'd say to the otaku, yeah, you can start talking about Gundam with her, mm. but the conversation can't end with Gundam. It can't mm. be, in this episode of Gundam, one red <laughs> Gundam flew past the screen at, at 23 minutes. Isn't that interesting? Mm. No, 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 no. It, it has to be something like, well, there's this character in Gundam that kind of died before he was able to have, live any of his dreams in life. And you know what? Before I die, I really want to have a family and live a good life. You have to start with the specific and move to the general, right? I mean, that's how you search for truth, and then you can bring it back to the specific again. So in the same way, you can start with Pachinko. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I do. I got you. I got you. Well, maybe I, I mean it's a little bit arrogant to say the logos, but what I really meant was kind of wonder at life. Mm. In a, in a weird way, it almost fits in with like the last essay, doesn't it? Yeah, all things have their season. Yes. <laughs> and yes. It's, it's weird how these all like link together. Well, how is this happening? Um, I don't know. Maybe... You didn't plan it that way. No. no. We just <laughs> randomly picked them out. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's just how wonderful Montaigne is. <laughs> you just pick five random essays and they all seem to fit together. <laughs> and isn't this last essay about fitting things together too? Yes. Wow. Uh, this is so many levels. Um, I didn't even get to look at this one. The other ones, I, I, read, I read two and a half 
Mm. I didn't look. I didn't even look at this one, so I'm just gonna be listening. All right. Um, so I don't know, Dustin. I'm not sure. What, I don't know what you got out of this one. It's, it's kind of very short. Mm, it's um, very short. I got out of this one. Um, basically, know yourself and act accordingly. Um, don't do something just because it's something that sh quote unquote should be done, right? Yeah, try try to um, try to fit in what you're doing with who you are and what what state in, uh, stage of life you're in. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very there, again stoicism is creeping into this essay at the very mm -hmm. end, but um, I kind of wanted to read it as like a proto 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 essay about organic unity, like. Mm -hmm. Make make all of your life kind of fit together, mm -hmm. in all of its parts fit together, and don't start learning something that it's totally going to be totally unfruitful to you just because people say you should do it. Right. I like this part when he said that the only comfort he finds in his old age, and I, I bet this is going to be the same for me probably when when it happens to me is is that it deadens me in many desires and preoccupations that are disturbances <laughs> yes. of my life. For how, care for how the world goes, care for riches, rank, knowledge, and health, and for myself. Right? In other words, you know, when you get older, you stop caring about, you know, what other people think of you, and, you know, who cares? Mm. And you, like, like, who cares, right? Who cares what people, as long as you're doing what, what, make, what makes your character complete, and you don't feel this, like, I don't know, total drive and ambition to total fit it, to feel like you have to fit in all the time. Yeah, that's, that could be one of the comforts of old age, I think, is that you don't feel like, you don't have to feel like you have to fit in. The pressure, mm. the feeling like you have to be part of something, right? I think this essay could be very useful for Japan. Don't you think a lot of salarymen, yeah. like all their lives, I don't really, and it, this does seem so un-Japanese of them. Like, though, they, they spend all their lives at work, and they never think about what that's going to mean when they retire, and yeah. they no, no longer have that position at that company, and they no longer have that status and then they come home to their wife, who they've been ignoring for the last 20 years. Who hates and their guts, right? Exactly, who hates their guts, mm. right? Who can't stand having them around. And then they treat their wife like their new buka, like their new staff member. Mm. Yeah. Like, oh, come with me to the grocery store now, woman. Right? You're <laughs> kind of like, you are not, you are not a mid-level manager anymore, right? Mm. You're with the woman you chose to marry, right? Mm. And you, you, you don't have a hobby now. I mean, what are you going to do? All right? You never thought about this? You never... Like all your life, you're paying for retirement, and like your wife is saving up for retirement, and and this is what it turns into. Come on, man! You, you oh, this is one of the most tragic things of Japanese society, and I really want this to go away. I want these people to have happy retired lives, but like this is in the news constantly about how all these late age divorces are happening, and there's a new wow. type of stress now. Like they call it like, was it husband stress? <laughs> and from this is like this is true. They they they've actually labeled this as a new type of stress for husbands what? retiring and coming home. Oh, the um, husband has stress, not the wife. Or the the wife. It's the oh. wife. The husband. The the stress comes from the husband coming home and oh. then pretending his wife is um or he still has it in his mind that his wife is his like because he still he has a subordinate. He has he has this co company mindset and because yeah. the company was the only place he had value in his life. All right. Right. right, right, and he so he brings that home. I like how that fits into like this idea that your life kind of has to fit a hole. But mm -hmm. for these people after they retire, there is no hole left anymore. It's like mm -hmm. this like weird added chunk on to what is a story that should have been ended. They should have died when they retired, right? But there's yeah, this yeah. Weird chunk at the end, right? Where they don't know what to do with. It's just this weird part at the end. They're like, what, what, what happened? Like, and it it really feels like a failure of the educational system to look death straight in the eye. Yeah, they, you will die, and yeah. you're not living. To I also eat. think it's it's kind of interesting. Speaking of that, I don't. Know, I want to bring this up at a later date. But don't you think it's interesting that one of the worst insults in Japan is shine? Yeah, one of the worst insults in Japan is die. That's a, one of the worst possible insults you can say. Like, is, wow. doesn't that betray such an insane fear of death? Yeah. Right. I mean, death is just like wow. I mean, don't don't even speak the word. You know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe I'm taking this too far. No. But like, I I want them to think about death. I, I do. Like, this is this is the product. Like these guys coming home without having a plan for their retirement. It's a product of not having the, not facing up to the fact that you know. You're gonna go, man. I mean, try to make it. I uh, you know, put everything together. <sighs> it's so sad. 
Yeah, I mean, like, that's why Tyler Durden in Fight Club, I mean, like, I, I talked to a couple of my friends here, we have a kind of cult movie thing, but when I was talking about Fight Club, they said that Tyler kind of was kind of uh, destroying those people's self-confidence in the Fight Club by telling them that they were shit and that they were going to die. And I said to them, well, no, actually, death, at least the way Tyler thinks about it in Fight Club, death is a liberation. It's a liberation from the values of this world, right? To know that you're going to die gives you the courage to be the person that you want to be. Yes. Yeah. And actually, I really am very sad, but, like, wow, how does this all fit together? Um, Montaigne, <laughs> in, in the actual... In the actual book, the essay before the essay on the imagination is titled To Philosophize is to Learn How to Die. And it's all about how doing philosophy learn teaches you how to die. And it fits yeah. perfectly in with the imagination essay. Perfectly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a liberation in a weird way. Like, some of these guys, you know, if they, had, they thought about it for a while, they'd be like, wait, what am I doing? Why am I slaving away? And, at this company, and I'm not getting yeah. any of the benefits, and and, and then I'm going to die, and that's the end. And that's the end. Right? I'm going to die without having done... Yeah. Wait. I'm going to die without... Okay. What, what, what should they do instead? Well, I mean, it depends on what you hold up as a virtue, or in our case, I think... I, I, I was thinking about this a little while ago, but I think that there's a difference in what we think of as what we consider mature or adult, and what mm -hmm. Japan considers mature or adult. Oh, now, yeah. I, I think Very what true. we consider a mature person in, 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 in the enlightenment, quote-unquote enlightenment West, is a person that acts from their own reason. Yeah. Whereas, a, is it, whereas a mature person in Japan does their duty, does right. what they have to do so that others can thrive, right? In I, other words, I, I often hear my students talking about that. Yeah, I yeah. often hear my students mention something, and it's sort of like they're they're going to flick on a maturity switch after university, and they will. Yeah. They, they mm -hmm. will. That's the amazing thing about it, but they, when, and they always say, when I join society. Yeah. Like, right now, you know, these lazy bastards, you know, like, are, yeah, exactly. they're, you know, they're like, they're, they're, not, they're like, I have this sort of you know, get out of jail free card right now because I'm not a part of society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I graduate, I'm going to join society. And then, you know, yeah, they'll work 10 hours a day and they won't, you know, they'll sacrifice a lot for for the responsible thing to do. I, I think, can I add to this, though? I think Japanese people think adults are people who support something. Yeah. Um, so, like, they, when they support their company, they're finally in it. Um, yeah. Now they're supporting no one. They're being supported. Yeah. Um, so as soon as they get in the position of supporting, um, they finally become an adult. And in a weird way, I think this is not alien to the West. It's not totally alien to the West. No, it's not. Uh, right. I think, like, don't you think a lot of people also feel like make, becoming a father makes you an adult because you are supporting a family and, and a child? No. Like, they have, this is, it's there, but it's not really emphasized like it is in Japan. The Japanese just take it and emphasize it like a thousand fold, whereas in the yeah. West we emphasize independence. Yeah, because being... I was going to say, yeah, because we have alternative lifestyles. Yeah, exactly. Whereas, whereas here it's sort of monoculture, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, mm. I just think it's a different, I mean, like, so I just think it's a different way of thinking about maturity and what you should or shouldn't be doing. And to say, well, they should be doing one thing or the other. Well, that just depends on the kind of society or life you want to live, right? But if they're complaining about, oh, my God, we don't have any leaders anymore, well, what do you expect, right? Mm. You breed people, you raise people to not be leaders. So, yeah. so did you think that you were going to get a bunch of leaders now? But you're, the culture is very safe, and there's no crime, and, and, and well, relatively no crime. I mean, there's a lot right. of crime, but the relatively no crime. Well, that's another effect of society, too, like the way that they raise these people. So you know, there's goods and bads. I mean... But if they all think that they're going to get the best of both worlds, well, that's just not going to happen. I think that there can be a happy medium, though. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they, can, they can lean a little bit more towards letting people think for themselves a little bit more. Japan definitely needs to start leaning the other direction a little bit. I mean, I'm sorry, if you're 60 and you don't know how to make rice, there's I mean, problem. there's a problem. Yeah, there's that's a, problem. a, a fundamental, yeah. 
a little say, bit more. So what are they afraid of? You think a little bit more of independence will create violence? And I'm not just talking about like, you know, like physical violence, so just like, you know, sort of like, sort of like violence, you know, in, in, in that sort of revolutionary thought sort of violent way. That's what they're afraid of. Well, I, yeah, that, I, I think if you would just ask the common person, they, if you were just to go do whatever you do, wanted to do, they just what they would do is they call you selfish. Yeah. They call oh, you yeah. Like mama, right? They'd say that you're just being selfish, and you know we're all and they're not wrong. I mean, this is the worst part is where Japan needs to be a little more like America. America needs to be a little more like Japan, because like right, I mean, yeah, look, a country doesn't work. Unless you know the people are working together, right? That's yeah. just a sad truth, um, you know. And we're so close together in Japan. If mm. the guy next to you is is a real jerk, you're gonna feel it. Um, so you need everybody working together to get those trains working, to have a peaceful life, right? You you need everyone to be working together in this way. And yeah, I and mean, they're not wrong when they say, well, it it takes a it takes a country or it takes a village to raise a child. But yeah, that's not entirely one hundred percent wrong on their, for their part either. I don't think they're wrong about it. It's just that they go too far a little bit. Yeah. That's all I think. I mean, it, but it does take an entire community to raise people and to make sure crime goes down and to make sure you're not living, especially in Japan where you're so close together, a hellish life. Just think of, like, you know, Americans living two feet apart from each other. We'd probably kill each other. Yeah. <laughs> that would be scary. Well, we need that space because we probably would murder each other in the night. Yeah, we need that space. We value that space. Yes, we, we, we have the right to that space. Yeah, well, at least for now we do, until America becomes as populated as every other country, right? And yeah, and God, I hope people have a lot, of, a lot more, like, moral responsibility than that. I think that's irresponsible. I think that's immature. Like, you know... Having a ton of fucking kids nowadays, you know what I mean? Like nowadays. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 It's wow. Uh, wow. I don't want to bring up Big Daddy, which is a Japanese TV show. It's just all <laughs> about this irresponsible father who has this has like like seventeen kids or whatever. Oh my god, I hate that show too much. I hate that show so much. I watch it every single time, mind you. <laughs> but I hate it. I hate the guy. I hate his wives, his ex wives now, <laughs> and I hate everything about it. I feel sad for the kids because they have such a terrible father. Oh, What's anyway. the show? Why Why are they doing this show? What's the point? The uh, question. Um, it's about this. Do they, guy. do they do they do shows like that in Japan? Do they do? You know how in America, like the, there's like a message or something like behind. You know, like mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Like, or is it? Just, oh yeah. Okay. There, there's. I mean, the message behind Big Daddy is um, largely. Um, it's all about how he's gambatteru. He he is he's doing his best, yeah. even though he's in. He has so many kids. But he, he, he. They they don't live in the best of conditions. He doesn't have the best of jobs. But here he is, toughing it out. Um, the Japan. This so resonates with the Japanese. It, it resonates on so many levels. And like, here's this guy. I mean, like the worst. The, the problem is like, if you just think about his life for ten seconds, you realize like he he's the source of all this. Uh, <laughs> he is the source <laughs> of it, right? I mean. I, he's the reason why you know, like these kids live this squ this in this squalor. Mm. Uh, uh, but w don't think about that, right? I mean, he's he's doing his best. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's going for it, <laughs> right? Oh God! Uh. And you know, he does. He never has sex with a condom. So I mean, that's why you know he has so many kids because he has some kind of weird belief against having sex with a condom. So kids yeah. pop out one after another, and it's like, oh, stop! You can't support the ones you have. Uh, and this here is these, a, this is a drama. No, no, this is a real. This is these are real people. This it's is, a reality put, show. It's a reality show. Yes, these are real yeah, people. This is real. These are real people in Japan. It. You can find wow. this guy. Yeah. Wow. I know it's rare. It's rare. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm shocked. I'm in shock. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I can't believe they would even broadcast that. Like because you know, it's just yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. It's I know, right? You're right. Like most, 
most Japanese people would not be game for be having their lives broadcast, but like yeah. Big Daddy is. Uh, so they they do. <laughs> Big Daddy. <laughs> Big Daddy, that's his name. That's his nickname. <laughs> Here he is, like married one woman. She ran off. <sighs> left him with all the kids and then here he finds this other woman and before the marriage he's already got her knocked up and he brings in other kids into the relationship who she has and then they get into fights and then they get divorced and is like they have to break up with their new brothers and sisters and the woman he married is obviously mentally unstable her children are calling her by her first name Oh. Um, I know it's just it's just oh big daddy but he you know you know he just hates that condom right yeah. it just it doesn't feel so good you know that's yeah. the, there's the imagination right there gotcha. <laughs> right there gotcha. we go uh, he doesn't want that condom so he's got to be pumping out kids with every single woman he encounters <laughs> uh, big daddy I'm gonna big oh, daddy. I, I want to punch you in the face he was at the last day. <laughs> For some reason, he was at the last AKB election sitting in the audience. I don't know why. I'm sure we'll see on the next special why he was there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, sorry, a little off topic, but... <laughs> All right, let's see. Ooh, I think that's I a good time to finish things up, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Uh, let's take it offline. I want to discuss what we're going to do for next week. And uh, yeah, then we you can get Jesse in because he didn't have a chance to uh, to get in, so we'll him pop in after we're offline. Okay, so I'll take us offline. Take us off. Interesting stuff, Big Daddy. Fight Club uh, is a movie that is often referenced, and I've never seen. Never I've seen Fight Club. I've never really? seen it. 